We're good? All right. Well, uh, let me introduce you guys, if you don't know, to Carmen Smith. I don't know if I introduced myself. My name is John. Uh, this is Carmen. Carmen is our director of ministries, and she has been serving at this church on staff for over eight years. And so almost from the very beginning, uh, Carmen has been an integral part of this specific uh, local church. Um, she is, along with that, she is a mother of three children, which is crazy. Can't believe you would do that. Um, she's, she's married. Brad, Brad Smith is her husband, and Brad also works full-time. He's a golf coach, and the Ohio State men's golf team that he coaches just got second at regionals and is now going to nationals, so that's amazing. That's the Ohio State University, and along with that, just so you know, for future interactions, Carmen is one of the biggest Ohio State fans that you'll ever meet in your life. And her father, Mark Malin, who's kind of like a mentor here, he also is a huge Ohio State fan. And he named her Carmen, actually, most people don't know this, after the Ohio State song, Carmen, Ohio. And that's really fun. And the first time I heard that song, I was so mad. Name, I thought, oh my gosh. You have to be an Ohio State fan with that. All right, Carmen. So um, going into this week, next week is Memorial Day. Next weekend is Memorial Day weekend. And we have decided as a church to intentionally not gather together next weekend. And one of the reasons that we're doing that is we want to give people an opportunity on a long weekend to be with their family, to travel, to see people they don't often see. And what we're going to talk about today is we want to give people an opportunity to take a step towards the practice and habit of rest and rejuvenation. Um, this is something that I think everybody needs to hear because almost everybody here that I know, and I know most of you, are bad at rest. And so we have to understand why this is important. So Carmen, why don't you tell us a little bit from your perspective about why this is a topic we would cover on a Sunday morning. Yeah, so um, I am a self-proclaimed terrible rester, but I have learned and believe that it is truly crucial to not only us as human beings, but to us really uh, reaching our full potential in Christ. And so I think it's something that matters, but we're not great at it. Um, whenever I ask someone the question, how are you? There's two responses I hear nine out, of, nine out of 10 times. It's some variation of how tired we all are or how busy. Busy, yeah. You all agree? It's always that. Oh, you know, we're good. You know, we're just crazy busy. We just can't get caught up. Everything's just blah, blah, blah. Yesterday, uh, I saw someone and I said, how are you? And their response to me was just flat out tired. And I don't know if I've ever asked someone how you're doing and they respond to me with some version of restful. Never. <laughs> rest fresh. is not like, yeah. Rest is not a cool word. It's not like some hot topic or trending cool phrase. And so... I think we're terrible at it, and vulnerable Carmen today, which is what you get, is I have struggled <laughs> immensely with rest, understanding what it is and really its importance, um, but I have started to take, I will say, baby steps into practicing it in my life, and it has started to change me mm. from the inside out already very dramatically, yeah. and so we believe it matters. Like, we as humans have got to figure out how to rest, and so we wanted to take some time before yeah. this week to talk about it and to have a dialogue. Yeah, when we started to think about how to go into a week that focuses on rest, um, I was actually very surprised at the preeminence of the idea of rest in the Bible. So it's not just something that's like, hey, this is good for your health, you should do this. It's something that, according to the scriptures, is woven into the very fabric of our creation. There's very few themes uh, when you read the scriptures that start on page one and are prominent all the way throughout the nation of Israel in the Old Testament, and then into the ministry of Jesus, and then into the truth of post-cross and post-resurrection. And for some reason, rest is one of those things that's constantly talked about and constantly emphasized. And so I want to show you guys really quickly where this pops up first in the Bible, and then we're kind of going to talk about um, what that means to us and how we're possibly supposed to pursue a life of rest. And so this is from Genesis chapter 1, starting um, on verse 26. And um, at this point, God has created the heavens and the earth, and he's created a world that's fit for the, fear of the flourishing of human life. And uh, this is the climax of his creative story and his creative powers, and this is what it says. 
And then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. And so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them, and God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it, rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. And then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it, they will be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds in the sky and all the creatures that move along the ground, everything that has the breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw all that he had made and behold, it was very good. And then there was evening and then there was morning, the sixth day. And thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. And by the seventh day, God had finished the work that he had been doing. And so on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. And then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. That's the end of the creation story. And for, you know, 30 verses, God had created a beautiful world that's fit for the flourishing of life. And every day he said it was good. And then he created humans, and he said it was very good. And then he was done creating, and he rested, and he called that day holy. And it says that it was holy because he rested. He didn't rest because the day was holy. The day actually became holy because God rested. And so there's something about what kind of world we live in where part of who we are and part of what's beautiful about what God has created is that at times... We get to sit back, cease production, and focus on the beauty of what we have. Be thankful for it, enjoy it, and rest. And so for all of the things that I just talked about Carmen is involved in, you can imagine that she has one of the craziest schedules that I've ever seen. And so when you see something about how important rest is to our lives, um, why don't you tell us a little bit about how that works in your life? Oh, haha. Ha. It's almost ironic. Um, until recently, I would seriously grade my rest in my life as like an F plus. I mean, I was beyond. <laughs> That's not a grade. Beyond. Beyond. Terrible at it. And um, I would describe my life, like many of you, as just controlled chaos. That was the, the phrase I used. I have, you know, three young kids, seven, five, and two. My two-year-old is, um, he's bad. I'm serious. I'm serious. <laughs> I do not say this to him because my mom told me I shouldn't, but he, I do not like him right now. I love him. I love his little guts out, but I do not like him. He is so difficult. So three kids, one being very bad. Um, my husband and I both work full-time out of the home. He travels all the time for long, long periods of time. And um, uh, we have no family here. And uh, then on top of that is just life. And it's not abnormal necessarily, and it's not bad. I don't think I'm more busy than some of you sitting here today, but I would describe my life as frantic. I was in this constant state of franticness, and I have had seasons where busyness has left me almost feeling, um, the word I use is numb. Hmm. Like I'm actually in this constant motion, but I'm doing it in this robotic hmm. fashion where I really don't feel any of it. Mm -hmm. And I use the analogy that if my life was a wagon, I kept adding more and more things into it, and I kept doing more and producing more and adding calendar. Everything was more. And then I wouldn't be able to pull it, yet I was surprised that it wasn't just, you know, pulling with ease behind mm -hmm. me. I had a funny experience. It kind of woke me up. It is kind of funny and was kind of sad for me, but it was an aha moment. Um, my husband and I have our two oldest girls go to school, and so one of us takes them to school every day. And the five minutes before, especially if I'm taking to school that day, before that happens, I mean, it's, it's tornadic, okay? I'm a whirling tornado going through my house. And so usually what happens is there's five minutes left before we have to be in the car, 
And I'm upstairs still, you know, doing my eyeliner, curling my hair, getting ready, hating my <laughs> outfit. So I just start screaming commands from the top of my stairs. I pray I'm not the only person doing this. Sometimes you finish all that stuff when you get to work. Yes, I know. I do. Actually, I'm like, I haven't brushed my teeth. But don't worry, you guys. My toothbrush is in my back. <laughs> um, so, so I'm screaming all these commands, you know, brush your teeth, brush your hair, get your shoes on, get your backpack, get your lunchbox, get in the car. Just get in the car. Just please get in the car. I say that five times a morning. And we get in the car. And this particular morning, um, we start driving to school. And, I mean, I'm, I'm going way too fast. And my seven-year-old daughter, she is the sweetest soul, and she really does think before she talks. So when she says something, I know she means it. And so she says to me very quietly, Mommy, um, I, I wish Daddy would take us to school. <laughs> yeah, Brad. And I said, oh, and I think I was actually snappier than this, but I was like, well, why? What, what do you mean? I'm trying to do my best. Why, why do you want Daddy to take you to school? And she said, because whenever you take us, Mommy, we're always late. And things are always crazy. And oh, man. I was like, oh, my gosh. And in that moment, I realized that, um, you know, what was outwardly busy was also inwardly busy. Mm. That my franticness wasn't just affecting the way that I did life, but yeah. it was affecting the way I spoke to my kids. It was affecting my short temper. It was affecting, really, this pace that was dangerous to my relationships. Yeah. And I had this moment where I was like, whoa, I got to figure out what's going on. So I'm going to dig a little bit deeper. I, I, give us an example, like a specific example of sometime recently where, you know, your inability to rest and, and kind of what you're talking about, slow down the pace, uh, you know, kind of spiraled out of control. Yeah. I mean, pick a week, any week, pick a week. Um, no, recently, probably when, when I describe spiraling out of control, uh, one of the factors that determines that is when it should be this um, joyous experience or celebration or moment in my life, and I'm not able mm. to fully go there because my pace is so exhausting. That's good, yeah. Um, Easter weekend was, was it for us. And again, I've been trying to learn how to rest, and then I have like these relapse times. But Easter weekend was a big weekend for us here, right? Mm. We had Good Friday, and we had Easter, and we had rehearsals that entire weekend. On top of that... Um, my husband, like John said, he coaches for Ohio State men's golf, and so they had their home tournament in Columbus, which is a very big deal for him. Yeah. Of course, that happened to be Easter weekend. So we both have all of this craziness going on. Smack dab in the middle, Mac, ugh, my two-year-old, he was sick. He was diagnosed with a double ear infection. In fact, he had strep throat. We didn't know. So, and he wouldn't take an antibiotic. So he was strep throat with no antibiotic. We all know that's like misery. So he was miserable. Uh, Brad was working. I was working. My in-laws were in town to try to help this chaotic situation. Mind you, I mean, we are celebrating that Jesus rose from the flipping dead. This should be <laughs> all exciting. And my husband goes on. They win their tournament. And they hadn't won it in 16 years. So, yeah, yeah. you Buckeyes are crazy. Yeah. So we Go have ahead, this Brad. extreme weekend of, like, victory and celebration in our faith and in our personal life. And you guys, my husband and I got to Sunday, and, I mean, we did not enjoy one second of that weekend. Mm -hmm. We didn't. I mean, it was so joyous, and all we did was feel guilt. We felt like we let yeah. down people. We felt like, you know, our kids were driving us crazy, and happy Easter, who cares? You won the tournament, big deal. We were going <laughs> through the motions. We were completely exhausted. And I said to him that Sunday, I looked at him, I said, this is not living. Really, the, the, if we can't enjoy, wow. you know, the beauty, the celebration of life, ah, we got to figure out what life is because this isn't a version that I want to keep living. Yeah. I mean, that's really insightful. I think that the, the, the scripture that we just read is kind of this idea that when God celebrated his creation, when he saw all that he had created, saw that it was very good, you know, he enjoyed it. That that's what made that seventh day holy, was that when you cease creating, when you cease producing, it's a time where you get to sit back and you get to enjoy not only all the gifts that you've received, but all the beautiful things that you have made in your own life. And so it's interesting that the thing that kind of alerted you to that was the lack of being able to celebrate simply because you're so overwhelmed with exactly the types of things that you should be celebrating, which is, which is really interesting. Why, uh, for you personally, besides just your stage of life, 
What is it that makes it difficult for you to rest, yeah. for you to stop the pace? I used to blame my stage of life, right? I would say it was my kids or my calendar or that Brad always travels or whatever it was. Mm-hmm. And I have realized that that is all a total lie. That mm-hmm. the number one reason that I do not and did not rest was because I did not prioritize it. I did not see its value and I did not let it have a place in my life and my heart. Uh, more importantly than that, some of you may uh, say yes, me too to this. I think that I got stuck in really the trap. I found that my worth and my value, I connected and I correlated wow. it to how much I achieved, how much I produced, uh, how many things I was able to yeah. juggle, how many things I could cross off a to-do list. I, I started to believe that that was what my value came from, that that was what my worth came from. And so I was in this constant state of motion and going and producing and achieving and results. And then rest was just this thing that happened because I was so worn out and I was so worn down. It, I mean, I had to. Yeah. I had to sleep at night. It was never intentionality that rest came out of. It was just necessity. Yeah. And um, I think that that's society, man. Society pushes us that you need to go do and you need to perform and you need to achieve and you need to post and you need to just constantly be doing that. And that's what they reward you for. Do you get a reward for rest? No, no, no. You get a reward for what you do. And so I started to attach my value to that. Um, That's dangerous, friends. I'm coming from personal experience. That's dangerous. Another thing for me, I think, is my personality type. Uh, If we have any Enneagram fans in the room, I'm an Enneagram 8. I am the challenger. (laughs) It's scary. Um, But seriously, my personality drives my inability to rest because 8s desire control. They desire intensity. They never want to be viewed as incompetent or weak. Uh, They have more energy than any other personality, and they struggle to ask for help. I say that out loud and I'm like, oh, I'm a terrible person. (laughs) But that is how I am. And so this desire to control really is what would drive my busyness because what would happen is I was in a constant state of trying to control everything. And if you're controlling everything, guess what else? You're also doing everything. Mm -hmm. And so I would never nap. I mean, I would try to lie down in my bed and take a nap and I could never fall asleep. Mm -hmm. I could never turn my brain off and let it go. I associated guilt with rest, I felt guilty if I rested because there was always something I should be doing or could be doing. And so much of that was driven from my personality. And um, I started to, when you operate that way, it's time after time, it's, it's unhealthy. And I started to feel like, ooh, something else is going on deeper here. Yeah, I mean, when you said that thing about value and worth, that was like, that was like piercing for me. Um, that is absolutely like the condition of my soul that I'm hoping Christ transforms because that is exactly what motivates everything that I do in my life. Um, Growing up, I came from a family where achievement is exactly what was celebrated. And so, I mean, it's kind of crazy. Like my mom was the alternate to the Barcelona Olympic Games in tower diving. And so, I mean, a great, amazing athlete, accomplished athlete. My oldest sister, Carrie, uh, was a world champion diver when she was 14 years old. And she went to Purdue on a full ride scholarship and won the Big Ten Championship five times because there's multiple events. So she was a five time Big Ten champion at Purdue. Uh, I played Division I college baseball. My brother, Kenny, my younger brother, uh, he, he played baseball. My other sister, Colleen, was a state champion lacrosse player in high school. And that is exactly um, what I became to believe made me valuable what I produce, and what I'm worth. Um, You know, the problem with that, as Carmen was alluding to, is that that is a beast that can never be fed enough. It never goes away. Because the thing about achievement is, what have you done for me lately? Right? So you achieve something great, and then what? I mean, think about it. Like, people who win professional championships in sports, they're back out practicing the next week because there's another season. I mean, you got to do it again. If you don't do it again, you get forgotten. And so when you live like that, and all of your value and all of your worth is tied to what you produce and how you perform, how can you for one moment stop producing? How can you for one moment stop performing? If that is what makes you valuable, good luck. Good luck sitting back and enjoying 
the beauty of this world. You can't. You have to always produce because your value is temporarily always tied to how you perform, how well you do, and what other people are talking about, your production. Um, and so, you know, that is a, a real underlying issue. And I think when we think about rest, a lot of times we think that, um, oh, I just need to do a better job of that. But I think what you just kind of awoke in me, um, awakened in me, is that um, there's something deeper. There's underlying issues. Um, I'm curious, like, how did you come to understand that about yourself? Yeah. How would you advise people to, like, start doing that? Yeah, so my, uh, what happened for me is my dad had a conversation with me that, that kind of rocked my world. And a side note, too, um, I'll say it this way, to seasoned parents who are sitting out here today, um, I want to encourage you to, like, never stop speaking into your kids. You know, I'm 31, hmm. and what my dad said to me about six months ago was extremely profound and needed for me. And I feel like as parents, we kind of think that our kids need us when we're young, when they're young, and I just want to encourage seasoned parents in this room to just keep talking to your kids and speaking life into them. But I think I was on the phone with my mom or I was talking to her about how frantic my life was and all I had going on. And I had no idea how I was gonna accomplish it, but I always end the conversation with, you know what, mom, I don't know, I'll figure it out, I'll manage it, I'll let you know how it goes, okay, bye. And before that ended, my dad, um, he said to me, he said, Carmen, I, um, I'm tired just hearing you talk about your life and I'm not even living it. Mm. And he said to me, um, Carmen, if you do not figure out how to slow down, and if you do not figure out how to get your pace to be controlled, you are going to burn out. Mm. He said, you are, you're not going to make it. Mm. And um, it was in that moment that I felt like I had this badge of honor that I was wearing that was miscompetent and misachieving and miss can do it all. And it felt like someone ripped it off and stomped it on mm. it on the ground. And in that moment, what he said to me, it struck something very deep inside of me, which is what you were alluding to, John. I, I felt it, and I was like, whoa, what did that just hit, man? And I think it struck something um, uh, in my soul that, you know, I wasn't just exhausted. I wasn't just busy. I was exhausted and depleted at a soul level. Mm. And that conversation awakened me to going really on a journey of rest. Yeah. So I guess as you've kind of started to move towards that or tried to move towards that with your family, what have you seen that it feels like you were missing out on yeah. when you were living this frantic life of, of no rest? Yeah, I'll share with you some of the things that I have, um, that I've just really learned. The first thing I've learned is, um, you know, that what I'm drawn to, what sense, made sense to me was pushing and it was action and it was constant going and it was lists and what has changed me is slowing uh, it's quiet, it's solitude, it's deep connection with people. I have leaned into this truth that my significance and your significance does not come from what we do, but because of who we are. Mm. And that's something I knew. Like, I grew up in the church. I've heard so many times, your identity is in Christ. It's in who he made you to be. You can be confident in that. That alone is enough. And that's all fine if you know it. But there are seasons in your life where you don't need to know it anymore. You need to feel it at a heart level. Yeah, that's great. And I have learned, mainly through solitude, which we'll hit on in a little bit, how for that truth not to be something I know, but to be something that I live out of and I operate from. Yeah. Uh, one thing that was fundamental for me was listening to a Rob Bell podcast called Manuha. John alluded to the passage in Genesis, but I'm not kidding you guys. This podcast, my dad sent it to me. It changed my life. It's good. Literally changed my life. I listened to it two times in a row. And um, basically, he talks about how the fullness of creation, the fullness of creation climaxed and was ended in this celebration mm. of rest. That God, the God of the universe, the divine, he included rest. Did God need to take a nap on the seventh day? The answer is no. He did not. He is God. But he wanted to teach us something. He wanted to tell us something. And he wanted to show us that, you know, as vital as doing is, so is not doing. That the fullness of human life, of, of who we are supposed to be in God, will only be experienced if we view rest as important as not resting. Yeah. 
And so I started to actually prioritize rest in my life. I started to notice that there are things in our world that need space. You hear these songs up here, and you know there's notes and songs, and then in between the notes is something called a rest. It's a pause. It's a silence. And when you put notes and you put the rest together, that makes a beautiful song. Yeah. Uh, it's similar with a piece of art. You know, you look at a painting and you see the lines and you see the color, but then you see space, right? You see contrast. And when you see those together, you see the fullness of it. And so I really started to understand that um, in order to, to be who God created me to be, I had to start to understand that Rest was a non-negotiable. It wasn't something that yeah. I should do. It was something that I have to do, and I started to do it, and it's, it's changed my life. And then the final thing is I've had to do some serious soul care. Mm. This is like the ugly digging. Um, I've started to understand that being busy is an outward condition, but being hurried is an inward condition. Mm. And I slip into being hurried when I let uh, my life and myself and me basically, I'm so preoccupied with it that I'm unable to be present with God and with others and with myself. And so I've had to basically rid myself of anything that disorients me from that. Mm -hmm. And then what that has led me to is a deeper level of rest. And here's what I mean. Um, I can have my house in total shambles and my kids can be losing their minds and I have learned how to still experience rest at a soul level. Yeah. And it has been something that has absolutely transformed me. It's come from me letting go of the myth that my worth is attached to what I achieve or what I produce or what I'm connected to. Um, it's me letting go of the wrong things and leaning into the right things. And one of those is being present, especially with my kids. Mm -hmm. I have had to specifically, um, this has led me to rest, is put this thing down right here. I'm telling you what, this piece of metal and screen is amazing, but it is, I swear, it's also the devil. <laughs> um, I had a moment, I was, um, I get the joy, the absolute honor and joy to put our son to bed every night. He always wants mommy, yes. And so we take him upstairs and I have him in a chair and I read him a story and then I just rock him for a few minutes and, and he drinks his milk and he just is kind of chilling. And I was doing this, this is probably, I don't know, three to five months ago, and when he starts to drink his milk and I'm done with the story, the first thing I do is I pull out my phone. Hmm. I get on my phone. I start, you know, sending an email, checking the weather. You know I'm obsessed with the weather, John. Yeah, it's um, weird. Looking at Instagram, responding to a text message. I mean, you, you, you think of it, I'm doing it on my phone because you can do everything on your phone. And one night I was doing this, and I noticed out of the corner of my eye that he was staring at me. And I was mm. like, oh, my God. And I put my phone down, and um, I realized in that moment that I have been missing, gosh, a lot of connection mm. because of my phone. You know, I multitask all the time. I pride myself on being a multitasker. And so I'll be playing a game with my kids. I'll be sitting with them, and I have my phone out. And I started to realize that, um, man, there's something special that happens when we look into people's eyes, isn't there? Hmm. And that I was missing out on a lot of moments, a lot of moments because of my phone. Wow. And I have found rest in being present with my kids and with my coworkers and with hmm. my husband just by putting my flipping phone down. Hmm. It has seriously changed my life. And um, I want to encourage every single person to do that. I think that God designed us that way to connect with people. And when we do, something really special happens at a soul level. I used to message prep. And you know what I would do to message prep? I would message prep. I would be looking at my computer. I would be going over my script and my notes constantly. And you know what I do now? I just chill out. Mm. I literally tell God, you know what, God? Um, I'm going to be confident in who you made me to be. I'm going to be confident that you gifted me with certain gifts and talents and abilities, yeah. and I'm going to go play mousetrap with Lyndon mm. because that's <laughs> what will fill me up. That's what will provide me with rest, and I think that there's something special that happens um, when we do that. I think that God wow. comes in, and I'm not perfect, man. I'm on a journey just like yeah. you are. My dad actually, he texted me yesterday. He said, you and John are doing the talk on rest. <laughs> I was like, geez, Dad, burn. Thanks, Mark. But anyways, um, I'm on a journey, but I'm trying to figure it out. Yeah. 
Um, I heard somebody say that, that busyness is the enemy of presence. So like if you ever think about when it's hard for you to focus on somebody, it's because there's something on your mind that's taking you away from that. Um, and so, uh, you know, that's really interesting, especially when you think of what it means to be a Christian and to be a disciple of Christ. Uh, Jesus was asked, what are the two most important commands? And he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. So the ethic of Jesus is love God and love people. And the thing that's interesting about that is that he didn't make that up at all. That is absolutely consistent through the Hebrew scriptures that he was a rabbi, a teacher of. Um, And when you look at the Ten Commandments, which is kind of like the ethical guidelines of the Old Testament, even though there's 613 laws, those ten are kind of like the foundation. And something interesting when you look at those is that the first three are about loving God. You shall have no other God besides me. You shall not fashion idols in my image or in the image of other gods, and you shall not misuse my name. Say my name in vain. Those are the first three. It's about God. And then the last six are about people. Right? So love God, love people. The last six, it's like do not murder, do not steal, do not covet. All about people. And so you're missing one, and it's the fourth one. And the fourth one that brings the first three and the last six together is the command to Sabbath, to keep the seventh day holy and restful. And I think that part of what it is about us as, as created beings is that if our mission on this earth is to love God and love people, I think that that order of the commandments that God gave to his people shows us that if you do not rest, if you do not rejuvenate, if you do not take time to enjoy, you will not be good at loving God and you will not be good at loving people. Um, I think that that truth is right there in, in the scriptures all the way through Um, And so that's kind of amazing how rest starts to affect even the way that we're able to follow Jesus. And um, so, so, I mean, this is like really good, Carmen. I appreciate your vulnerability. Um, A lot of people might be sitting here and being like, yeah, that's that's great. Um, I have no idea how in the world I'm supposed to make my life more restful. So could you maybe help them out with your experience over the last few months? Uh, What are some steps this week going into Memorial Day that people can intentionally focus on and take yeah. that help to bring a little bit of rest into their life. Yeah, I'll share a, you know, a few quick tips. Um, I think the first one, this sounds silly, but you have to start prioritizing it. You really do. You have to view it as something that is you know, as important as anything else you do in your week. And I think that it starts there. You know, make a place for it in your life. Uh, The second thing for me that has been crucial is the word solitude. Hmm. I have had to figure out how to get alone so that I can spend a few minutes alone with God. And I'm telling you, that's hard to do in my house right now. (laughs) My kids, I'm like, why why are you up at four in the morning? Or, you know, whatever time it is. And so I have to get up really early in the morning. And I've made a rule that I only have this time when I am 100% totally alone. If anyone is up, I'm like, nope, never mind. We're not going to do this right now. And in that moment, what I do is um, I, I'm really actually quiet. It is bizarre. I'm never quiet. Um, you can ask anyone. I would that like knows. to see that. Actually. Yeah, I know. Interesting. And I sit there and I ask God to speak to me. And, and, you know, some of those things about my value and my worth, I say sentences and phrases out loud in the presence of God. And I believe when I do that, he's there and he kind of like reaffirms them back to me. And then I ask him to help me to not be busy and and hurried at an inward level. And so um, I heard one of the greatest acts of spiritual growth is the act of doing nothing. And so I'm working on doing nothing, creating that space in my life. It's really hard to do, but I'm trying really hard to do it. I think it's important to understand that that can just be a moment. I mean, really. It you, know, you don't have to like live a life in solitude like a like yes. a monk. Yeah, it right. Can, you can have your busy life and just make sure that you're taking intentional yes. moments yes. To, for That's solitude great. and silence. Um, another thing I've had to do is I've had to learn how to say no. Yeah. <laughs> it's the most painful That's word hard. for me. I'm a yes person. I love to say yes. I love to be with people. I'm an ex- extrovert times like a thousand. It fills me up and I have learn my rest meter, and when I am, like, getting to the red line, I have to say no. Mm. It's been really hard for me because I absolutely love to say yes, but I've learned how to say no just to social stuff and to really figure out when I have to say no. Yeah. Um, and then 
you know, another thing is you have to figure out what rest is for you. What brings you rest? You know, for, for my husband and I, traveling brings us rest. That's something, especially without my kids, that's something that, like, fills my <laughs> soul up, <laughs> fills my life up when we travel and we don't have our children. Um, uh, working out for me, shout out to 3 Minute Fitness in New Albany, that's yeah, my yeah. gym. Um, I go there and it sounds like an oxymoron that I work out and I experience rest, but it fills me up. The endorphins and what it does for mm. my, my body, it, it is something that is restful for me. Um, you know, being present, going on a walk, experiencing creation, listening to worship music, man, that is something that literally calms my soul. What is it for you? I think you have to identify what rest is and then you have to make it a habit. You have to actually do it. So prioritize. Moments of, of solitude, solitude. Uh, saying no, yeah. and actually identifying what brings, brings you, you rest. rest. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. What do you do, John? <laughs> it's a good question. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the things about ministry is that if you have a spouse who works in the marketplace, which Jenna works for Hollister, um, you know, your weekend, my weekend, is Friday, Saturday, and I'm working today. And Jenna's weekend is Saturday, Sunday, and she works on Friday, which means that the only opportunity that she and I really have to hang out with each other all week, uh, to be married together, is Saturday. And so one of the things that we've done is, you know, understanding that we're not under the, the law and we're not commanded to take a Sabbath as a part of our ethic, but we have actually made Saturdays our Sabbath where we refuse to open our computers and do work, we refuse to check our emails on our phones, we refuse um, to, to, to give in to all of these things that we do all throughout the week that take our time and attention, and we focus on each other, and we focus on being together, and it's actually very, very restful for us. And that's probably literally the only practice of rest that I have woven into my life right now. Uh, which is why I was asking the questions and Carmen <laughs> was, was sharing her experience. Uh, is there anything else that, that you want to share before, no, before we I, go? I think I just said it to you. You should just start somewhere. Start somewhere. And, um, you know, I think that we're go going, only going to really be who God wants us to be. We're going to experience the life he has for us when we include rest. And so when I started to learn that, I mean, don't we all want? to live our lives like Jesus, don't we wanna look like him and emulate him? Yeah. And we do, and so it's like, then go after this beautiful practice that he wants us mm -hmm. to do, that he values, and I think it'll draw us closer to him ultimately. Yeah, that's great, so. that's great. Well, everybody, give it up for Carmen. Thank you for sharing with us. Thank you for being vulnerable. Uh, that's obviously not, not easy to do. Um, what we're going to do to, to end this is I just kind of want to take a moment to bring everybody back together and remember that, that probably the most important thing that we talked about here is that our inability to rest is actually not typically strictly tied to our schedule. That our struggle with ceasing and enjoying and being present uh, has much deeper ties that we have to dig into and discover. And those are the places in your life that's going to hurt to dig. You know, you don't want to go there. That's the place that you don't want to go to. And so what I shared about value, what Carmen shared about worth and value and expectations, you know, these are things that every single person in this room, that has been woven into who you are. You believe that you are valuable because of what you produce and how you perform. We all do. Uh, like I said, this is the crutch of my life that I pray every day to try to get rid of. And when you think about that, that idea that's gotten into our heads, you know, what I want to bring comfort to everybody today is that that's a lie. Carmen said that. It's not true. It's a lie. You are not valuable. You are not intrinsically worthy because of what you perform and how you do external tasks in the world. You are loved in and of yourself, it's intrinsic, it's inherent, it's who we are. But we believe the other thing, we believe the lie, and that lie, since it's tied to our activity and production, it becomes burdensome, and it becomes heavy, and it weighs on our souls, and it marks us. 
and it makes it nearly impossible to rest. If production and performance is what gives you value, you will never stop producing and you will never stop performing because how could you for a moment jeopardize the very thing that gives you value? When Jesus was teaching and preaching, uh, when he was here in his ministry, he said, come to me all you who are weary and heavy burdened and I will give you rest. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And one of the things we have an opportunity to do with Jesus is to exchange this lie about performance and production and to believe and step into and live the reality of how God actually feels about us as demonstrated in the person of Jesus Christ and the event of the cross. One of the reasons that the burden of Jesus is light and that the yoke of his teachings is easy is because the whole episode of the cross and the resurrection and our salvation is exactly the point that it is not what you do. In fact, you cannot earn it. The Apostle Paul says that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Well, before we were reconciled, before we've done anything, before we did anything to earn and to gain our value, God became flesh and blood in the person of Jesus Christ. And he broke his flesh and he spilled his blood for us. Do you want to know why I can stand here and say you are a child of God regardless of what you do? It's because God showed it in the person of Jesus and the event of the cross. The cross takes this idea and this lie that your value is tied to production and performance and it shatters it because those two narratives cannot live beside each other. It's impossible. They're mutually exclusive. You, you are loved either for what you do or for who you are. And the Christian story, the gospel, says that you are loved for who you are, not for what you do. And so we step into that truth and we start to find rest and we start to believe that we really can sit back, enjoy what God has given us, enjoy what we produce and rest and rejuvenate well. Now one of the things I'm always conscious of is that when we believe these types of lies, they're deeply embedded into who we are. Telling you it's not true sometimes isn't as effective as we want it to be. Just telling you that's a lie, believe this other truth, sometimes is not quite as effective as what we want it to be. And so we're not just going to say it today, we're going to experience it with our senses. And so what we're going to do here in a second is everybody's going to stand up and everybody's going to walk to one of the four communion tables that's around and you're going to go up and you're going to grab the bread that symbolizes the body of Christ that was broken for you and you're going to dip it in the juice that symbolizes the blood of Christ that was spilled for you, this reality of the gospel being love for who you are being brought from death into life and we're not just going to say it and we're not just going to try to believe it and think it. We're going to take that bread and that juice and we're going to consume it. We're going to feel it. It's going to become a part of us. And so together as a community, everybody can stand up right now. And when I release you, make your way to one of these communion tables. Come back. Take a moment and reflect on how you plan to take a step towards what God has called you to do, which is to rest, to be a restful person. How are you going to take a step this week? What are you going to do? What are you going to put into your life because Jesus loves you for who you are, not for what you do? Emily's going to come out. She's going to sing a beautiful song, and we can stay seated when she does that and continue to reflect and rest in the person of Jesus. You guys can go to the tables. Imagination beckons a calm. 